see. And when we stumble and it all goes wrong, only you can make it right. So I say, oh, 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 oh. I'm learning to be alive. Oh, 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 oh. I'm learning to be the light. Oh, 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 oh. So much brighter living in your world, Savior, what you did for me. You gave me something I want everyone to see. When we stumble and it all goes wrong, only you can make it right. So I say, oh, 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 oh. I'm learning to be the light. Oh, 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 oh. learning to be the light. Whoa, whoa. So much better living in your world Saving what you did for me You gave me something I want everyone to see When we stumble and it all goes wrong Only you can make it right So I say, oh, 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 oh. I'm learning to be the light Whoa, whoa, whoa. Learning to be the light. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Learning to be the light. The Lord be with you. It's nice to see you all here. I just got back yesterday before Saturday evening worship after being at the Synod Assembly since Thursday. And um, Mike and Nancy Holman were our delegates, as well as um, Carl and Lisa Westland as well as Erica Youngquist, who's back in our AV booth. Uh, they represented us, and Mick and I attended also. I want you to look at your messenger and note when there is a car wash fundraiser coming up. I think it's June 18th. You might want to consider that to help our youth. Dick is going to tell us something about the Mission Investment Fund. Today is the uh, first Sunday of the Endowment Emphasis Month. We always traditionally have that in June. And we're announcing today the uh, grants that the fund made this year uh, one of them was new security cameras, one of them was a projector for up here, a new uh, entrance on the east side of the church. We uh, also uh, sent some youth to camp. Those were the uh, things that were done here within Messiah. Then we've reached out to uh, the community with a backpack program for the school. We've uh, also <coughs> allocated some uh, funds to uh, world missions through the ELCA. So in total, we've given $10,000 to these funds this year. So that's, that's the good news, and it's really nice what the fund has been able to do over the years. It has over $400,000 in it right now. And uh, we're encouraging the congregation to keep adding to that fund so that uh, we can keep increasing our gifts in the future. One of the uh, areas where we have not given yet this year is in outreach to the community and the world. So we've got another 
$10,000 approximately available for those kind of projects. So I would encourage everybody in the congregation to think of ways that might be useful that we could use this uh, money for and we'll probably open up in the fall for additional grants. Now, if you would have been here earlier, you could all had some of our breakfast, but you're too late for breakfast now. <laughs> so. But we do want to thank the congregation for their participation and uh, getting this fund up to the uh, position that it's in. Thank you, Dick, and thank you to you and your committee of people and all the work they do. I believe, oh, let's see, our gospel text today is Jesus raising from the dead the widow of Nain's son, and we'll find out what that means for us. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please rise and join in singing. Saving grace. Here is the church. Here 
Living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God in three persons, a triple bloom on a single step. God the Father, who created the universe and is continually creating us. God the Son, who redeemed us by coming and pitching his tent next to ours. God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and is the love that gives our life meaning. We worship one God in three, and three in one. In this belief is life everlasting. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Almighty and merciful God, you established your church with the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with that sacred fire that we may ignite with a passion for your
We asked in that prayer that God would burn down the walls that keep us from Him. Those walls that represent everything in us that misses the mark. Isn't the way we want it to be, and certainly is not the way God wants it to be. God burns down those walls with a simple word, a word from Christ, that God Almighty forgives you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, 
A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The Gospel of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you. I think we'll forego a children's sermon this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today we're looking at this gospel lesson, Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain. In particular, we're going to talk about compassion. The poet from India, the Indian poet, Tagore, uh, tells this story. Uh, he had a servant, and of course anybody in India, if you are a uh, higher caste, you are expected to have a servant. Uh, I had a friend, my roommate in college, was in the Peace Corps in India, and just because he was an American, they expected him to have a servant. Tagore's servant was late one day and that just irritated Tagore and he goes this ungrateful servant he's getting lazy he's late and so he decided I'm going to fire him so the servant came was about an hour late and came and immediately didn't say a word just immediately started his duties he was sweeping the floor. So Tagore goes up to him after a few minutes and said, uh, get your belongings together and leave. You are fired. And he said his servant kept sweeping. And after a few moments of silence said, my little girl died last night. That's a story that illustrates what the world needs. The world needs compassion. What does the world need from the church? The world needs compassion. What do we need from one another? We need compassion. Oh, don't, doesn't the world need truth? Well, yes, it does. But I've seen Christians spend time on the truth but not convey compassion and make that truth seem so harsh and hard. The world needs compassion. And quite frankly, anyone you meet, you could ask them the question, what have you lost? Everyone is going through loss at any particular time. Whether that's a loved one or a grief over a loved one that may have died long ago, um, the health of a loved one, your own health, your children leaving home, <laughs> my car broke down, you name it, loss. We're all experiencing it. So what do we need? We need compassion. William Galston is a columnist for the Wall Street Journal and this week he had a column lamenting the fact that our country has 
lost his compassion. He suggests that there's a thin veneer, well, my words, there's a thin veneer over our culture that once that's picked, all kinds of bad things come forth. He writes this. We believed that changes in law and public norms had gradually brought about changes in private attitudes across partisan and ideological lines. We thought that long-standing racial and ethnic prejudices had been marginalized. We hoped that the most religious population in any Western democracy would deal compassionately with the suffering of refugees from war-torn nations, whatever their religion. We assumed that some beliefs had moved so far beyond the pale that those who continued to hold them would not dare to say so publicly. And speaking of how fragile this, this veneer of tolerance and concern and care for one another is, he writes, the critique of political correctness has destroyed many ta taboos and has given many licensed to say whatever they think. Beliefs we mocked now command a majority in some people's thinking. He's lamenting the fact that our country can so easily lose what seemed to be a compassionate view. Well, Jesus comes across this widow. Remember last week we were in Capernaum. Jesus just raised the centurion's servant, excuse me, healed the centurion's servant. And Jesus marveled and was amazed at the man's faith. And then he took the 25-mile walk, he and a whole crowd of people with him, to Nain. And as they were coming into town, coming out of town, was the funeral procession. And they were carrying a, a beer, which was really a stretcher, with this young man's body on it, probably a... Uh, older teenager, 17, 18 years old. And the woman was a widow, and now her only son had died. So what did that woman? She lost her husband, lost her son, lost status and identity. Unfortunately, status and identity in first century Israel was wrapped up in the men in the lives of women. It wasn't in, in the women. So everything the husband had passed to the son and now he's gone. The woman has nothing. Lost status and identity. Jesus sees it. And he has compassion. Physical feeling. A wrenching in the gut. That's what this word compassion means. Um, George Buttrick says it means, this compassion means the pain of love. Jesus had that wrenching in the gut. This word is rare in the New Testament, maybe used a dozen times, only in the New Testament. It's used three times in Luke. When the Good Samaritan looks upon the man in the ditch. Jesus said he had this same gut-wrenching compassion for the man in the ditch. When the father sees his prodigal son coming home, Jesus says he had this same gut-wrenching compassion in his gut, so much so that he ran, did something which was disrespectful for a older man in Jesus' society to do, he ran to his son. And of course, the third time, it's used right here. Jesus having this gut-wrenching compassion for this widow. 
Notice also, it doesn't mention faith. Did the woman believe? We don't even know if she knew Jesus. Did she ask, help me? All we know is that Jesus had the pain of love for her. So what does it mean for us? Jesus raised this widow's son. Ted says to Rick, what a lucky break that Jesus should run into this guy's funeral procession. Rick, but it's not just for him or his mom. It's a sign that God has visited all of us to overcome death for us. What does it mean? This is a sign that Jesus has visited all of us to overcome death for us. Of course, Ted's response, wow, that is a lucky break. I at least thought it was humorous. Our bishop at the assembly, talking about a different text, says um, that there's an undeniable fact here, an undeniable fact, that we are stuck with the resurrection. We are stuck as Easter people. Now, what does that mean for us? That means something needs to shift. Something needs to, st to change. We are stuck with the resurrection. We are stuck as Easter people. Diane Comp is a doctor. She's a pediatric oncologist. And one of her patients, Anna, was dying of leukemia. And her time was near. She was coming to the end of her life. And she was in Anna's room with Anna's two parents, devout Christians, and they called the chaplain in because Anna was about to die. Diane Comp, well-educated doctor, was an agnostic. She really didn't think much about God and didn't care whether there even was a God. She was simply agnostic. And then, she writes this. Before she died, Anna mustered the final energy to sit up in her hospital bed and say, The angels, they're so beautiful, Mommy. Can you see them? Do you hear them singing? They're so beautiful, Mommy. And then she lay back on her pillow and died. Well, the chaplain, Diane Comp says, was a little uncomfortable with what happened, so he left. Now, let's, social, social, let's show some compassion for this clergy person. We clergy are sometimes a mess with our own problems, and he certainly had his own problems. So he leaves. Leaves this agnostic doctor with these devout Christian parents to figure out what's going on. And Diane Comp says, At that moment, I ceased to be an agnostic. Why? Jesus had visited her with the truth of the resurrection. She was stuck with it. Something had to change. She believed. Well, we're Easter people. We're stuck with the resurrection. Something has to change. Has changed. Does change. Personally for us, personally as we deal with loss, and pain, personally as we deal with one another, 
and even as we deal with the world. One of the things that uh, is nice about going to Senate assemblies, they remind us that we belong to a great church, a great denomination, a worldwide denomination. And uh, I don't know if you realize that we set a goal of raising, as a denomination, raising $15 million to help fight malaria. And we exceeded that $15 million. And we have been in countries throughout the world, but primarily in Africa, fighting, helping to fight malaria. And some of those countries are listed. Angola, Namibia, Nigeria, Liberia, Mozambique, Uganda, South Sudan. Why? Well, we're stuck with the resurrection. We're Easter people. We're trying to change. Trying to change our world. Trying to touch it with our compassion and care. And uh, I was reminded right in our own synod, our fastest growing church happens to be in Garden City, Kansas. I've been there a few times. I haven't seen the garden <laughs> out in southwest Kansas. Of course, great meatpacking plants. So a lot of Vietnamese moved there. Now a lot of Mexicans are there. Our fastest growing church on our synod happens to be the new Hispanic start that's there. Only a few years old. Show you how successful they have been. 45 students in confirmation class. 45. That's a headache. <laughs> Why? Well, you and I can't be in Garden City, Kansas. It wouldn't be practical. And who wants to be there? <laughs> but we are there. Because our synod is there. Or down in Guatemala and Nicaragua, where there's parents are sending their children they're so concerned about their children. That's why parents, by the way, used to sell their children into uh, uh, harems and uh, have them become um, servants for the king because life was too hard. Uh, they're doing the same thing in South and Central America, sending their children on ahead. They're, they're minor children. Of course, their destination is the United States. They hope they make it. It's very unsafe. Well, the ELCA is down in Guatemala and Nicaragua, working with unaccompanied minors, trying to reunite them with their families. Of course, we, we believe in families in the ELCA, so we're trying to reunite, reunite them with their families, but at least trying to keep them safe wherever they are. They're unaccompanied minors. You and I can't be there. It's not practical. But the ELC, ELCA is there. Why are we there? Because we're stuck with the resurrection. We're Easter people. We know things have to change. And it's our way of showing compa compassion, sometimes in small ways and sometimes in great ways. Well, the good news today as Christ has visited us, you and I, each and every one of us, to help us deal with death, to help us realize we are resurrection people. Amen.
Please rise and join in singing as we share our tithes and offerings. of joy. Make your presence known in this congregation. Give us such a clear and bold share of your spirit that your life and vitality shine through us into our neighborhood. Lord, in your mercy, God of the living and the dead, work in your creation and work through us in such ways that lead to life for your creation and for all people. Lord, in your mercy, God of the city, we pray for cities, urban areas, suburbs, small towns, and all communities. We lift, lift up all who have suffered losses through storms, tornadoes, or floods, those suffering from the ravages of war and those suffering from famine or drought. Renew their spirits, give them strength, and help them find the assistance which they need to rebuild their lives. Lord, in your mercy, compassionate healer, Send your healing to the sick, especially Darlene Aaron, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Lucy and Lyle Dolly, Sandy Drake, Daniel Everett, Ron Fells, Shelley Gates, Jeff Hempville, David Jones, Alan Kamens, Chris Marquardt, Paula Merkley, Ellen Lassant, Willis Melgren, Eddie Miner, Gail Moffat, Norma Mueller, Carolyn Nyes, Lynn Peterson, Benita Stamper, and Lucy Stilwell. Are there any others? Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for these as well as others that we name in silence. 
We give you thanks that Mary Lou Fisher has received her heart transplant. We pray for her continued healing and strength. We, are, we know that you are the God of life. We pray that you gather us with all your saints in the promise of life forever with you. We pray that you comfort those who are grieving, especially the family and friends of Joe Boyce, of Jane Crisman, and of Dr. Meraved Karimi. Lord, in your mercy. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? You are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. The Lord be with you. L lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, to preach good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The table is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of grace. We thank you for this gift of life. Help us, filled with life, to leave this place sharing your love, your compassion, your joy with all we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, 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 our God,
disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture youth.